Hello, my name is Daniel, and you are listening to the Engineering Success Podcast, the premier engineering careers podcast. Whenever I was dreaming of becoming an engineer, I had one vision of what engineers do, and it involved a garage and startup companies that I had heard of and movies that I had watched. But boy, I was surprised whenever I got to engineering school and I started my classes and I started talking to actual engineers as I applied for engineering jobs. Engineers do a lot of things. The engineering degree is so versatile. And because of that, engineers do a lot more than just prototype new things. And that is why I started this podcast. Because if you told 12-year-old me what I do for a living now, my mind would have been blown. This is a podcast for aspiring engineers to learn more about what it's like to achieve an engineering career. Now, whether you're an experienced engineer, an aspiring engineer, or just trying to be an engineer, this is the podcast for you. Each week, we'll do one of two things. We'll either interview an engineer that has accomplished something in their career. Maybe they've become the CEO of a company, or maybe they've started their own business, or maybe they retired in time. That's one of our first interviews that we did is with an engineer that retired at 55. There are different goals that come with this career, and there's many different career paths. And I'm hoping that by listening to those interviews, you'll get to see what it looks like to have an engineering career and decide what you want to have as your career. In addition, we also have our mailbag type of episodes where I'll answer questions from you, my audience, about just random career topics, and also pull some other career questions from elsewhere. But anyways, this is the Engineering Success Podcast. If you want to be part of a community of aspiring engineers and experienced engineers helping one another grow as engineers in our careers, this is the podcast and the community for you. Hello, my name is Daniel, and this is the Engineering Success Podcast, episode 55. We have been on a little bit of a hot streak lately. We've been doing interviews, and we had two great ones before this, and we have this one with Deb Coviello. And we have more in the tank. Yeah, so if you have just started tuning in to the Engineering Success Podcast, then you tuned in at a great time. We have a bunch of really cool engineering career stories that we have been telling and that we will be telling. So thank you so much for your support of the podcast and and for listening in. Now, before we get to the rest of the intro and I tell you how my life is going, I need to thank two people. Thank you to John Ott and to Leroy Jenkins for being my top tier supporters of the podcast. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Uh, $10 a month gets you a shout out at the beginning of every single episode of the podcast. Uh, You just click in the description box and either Spotify or Patreon. I prefer Spotify. Uh, They take less of my money away in fees. But yeah, just uh, that helps me keep my website alive, www.engringsuccess.com, where you can see articles and links to different topics that we address on the podcast. And it also gives me a domain where I have an email. Daniel at engringsuccess.com, where you can email me if you have any questions or if you want to show up on the podcast. Now, this is episode 55, and this is a cool interview. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Uh, I also just recorded a new intro thing that goes at the beginning of every podcast, so give me some feedback if you like that as well. I think it's pretty cool. But yeah, it's a, it, it's a good time to be a listener of the Engineering Success Podcast, and it's a good time to be a Dollinger or a Grimes Dollinger. Things are going well here in the household. Baby E is sitting up on their own and playing, which is pretty cool. It also has given me a little bit of time uh, while they entertain themselves. And yeah, things are good. We found a church that we like. Uh, we just got back from a really refreshing holiday break and things are going good for me at work. So for those of you that are tracking on the baby process or or on how my career is doing or how my home life is going, things are good. Thank you for thinking about me. All right. Well, that's the pleasantries, uh, the intro of the podcast. So without any further ado, let's get into the interview. Hello, my name is Daniel and my guest on today's podcast is an accomplished engineer, business leader, and published author. Over her career, she's held titles such as Quality Engineer, Director of Quality Assurance, Operational Excellence Manager, Chief Quality Engineer, and multiple Chief Officer roles in a fractional capacity, a concept that greatly aligns with her nickname, the Drop-In CEO. And we'll talk about that more later. Deborah Coviello is the founder of Illumination Partners, where she, the Drop-In CEO, brings her knowledge and experience gained through many roles to identify, assess, and solve issues that are preventing business growth. She's the author of The CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Get Back on Track, a book that tells the CEO's hero journey through the unknown and how to guide them to peace of mind. And she has another book, The Secrets of the C-Suite, due to be published in 2024. 
hey, it's 2024. And one day I'll tell you, I too aspire to be published a published author, but today I will live vicariously through my guest. So the host of the Drop-In CEO podcast, where she connects her listeners with business, business leaders and CEOs who are doing the work of transforming their business from the inside out to help her audience learn to be an inspirational leader, to take care of their career, and to build a foundation, strong foundation of purpose. She has developed a powerful brand, in my opinion, and many other people's opinions as well, and a strong voice in the engineering and business operations conversation. And today, I'm so honored to have her join me in this conversation on engineering success. Deb, how are you doing? Thank you so much for smiling through that intro. Usually, I don't make people sit on video while I'm reading the intro, so I apologize. I just realized that you had to sit through the whole thing. How are you doing? No, I am doing great. And just so you know, I do the same exact thing on my podcast. I tell my guests, I do a dynamic intro because it's just all part of the process. It's part of the flow. And I appreciate the fact that you highlighted so much through my career. I sometimes forget how much I have done and where I've come from uh, to appreciate what I've done. And I hope, I hope, I hope I can impart some value for you and your audience today. So thanks for having me today. Thank you. And I know you will impart some value because uh, I've read your resume. I've read your experience. And you said earlier, it sounds like a tough interview. So, but, but the cool thing is, is that we're going to have a really cool story today, in my opinion, and I'm really excited to share it. So what did you do today, Deb? Oh boy, I was all over the place. I was grateful that I didn't have to stick with just one one client or one particular project. I jumped on an engineering project because I'm the quality engineer to help them with uh, failure modes and effects analysis. Then I went to the gym. Then I did a podcast interview with an amazing person in emotional intelligence. I reconnected with a colleague who has also been on my podcast, rested a little bit, spent some time cooking with the family and getting a dessert made for tonight. And rested and now I am here with you. So it was a little bit of a jumping all over the day kind of place, but I appreciate that sometimes having that freedom to pick and choose which activity to provide the most value. And it's not always been that way. Sometimes I've been overly stressed, but I feel really, really good today to do what I wanted to a little bit here and a little bit there. So that's my day. That's so cool. I, I, I love that's a full day that I'll be honest, you did a lot more than I did today. I guess we all get our same 24 hours and, and you definitely are doing a great job of utilizing your 24. Uh, well, it wasn't always that way. I mean, when I got up in corporate and didn't have some of these skills, I worked a lot, a lot, a lot of hours. And there were so many things I didn't do that I really enjoyed, whether it was reading or going to the gym or walking the dog or something. It was always very stressful. And I will tell you, I am a recovered, <laughs> a recovered uh, workaholic because now it's like, I only want to do the things that I'm really good at working with the customers. I can really help and just taking a little bit of time back because there's only a few, few hours, few days on this earth. So it's, it's been a challenge. You have to put in your dues being an engineer and providing those, that information that businesses so um, rely on you for. But at some point you have to say enough's enough and you need to slow down and do a little bit more for yourself and do great work for others. Yeah. So, so let, let's talk about that time as an engineer, will we? Sure. So how, how did you discover your passion towards engineering and to the point where you decided that you wanted to study engineering yourself. So Daniel, that's an interesting story. And I'll go a little bit back to high school. High school, I became a bit of a math and science geek uh, to the point where I really loved biology. And I actually would go competitively take tests in biology at the different school districts. So I used to compete academically in that area. And so my first pursuit was the sciences, again, math and science. I went to RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute to study biology. But the interesting thing along the way, and it was, I don't know what changed, but I realized I didn't want to go to medical school and I wanted to get in and out in four years. So the natural progression was, can I get into the school of engineering? And so after one semester, my grades were okay. I switched over to biomedical engineering, which would feed my soul, you know, because I love the sciences. I was very good at math, but oh my, go to an engineering school. You are no longer the best <laughs> anymore. Uh, so getting a C was actually okay in some cases. And I was then able to get a 
career or a job that I could monetize at the end of four years in biomedical engineering. And I focused on mechanical and materials engineering versus I had an option to go down the chemical route or the electrical work route, which was, oh my, I don't think I can do that. That's a little bit too hard. So kudos to all those people that focused on the electrical engineering component. And I was able to get a job. I mean, that was a focus to be independent, get a job engineering back in the 80s was very uh, profitable. There was a big demand for us. And uh, I wanted to do that rather than mm, going to medical school because I, I got totally turned off of medicine for a couple different reasons, but got totally turned on to manufacturing. And so I realized engineering was a good use of my skills, and my interests, and I was pretty good at it. So that's, there you have it. I got a degree in biomedical engineering, um, but based on, you know, a strong foundation in math and science. Well, and it's interesting that you you actually went to your call because I asked people why did you choose this school and why did you choose it for engineering but you actually chose oh. the university you chose because yeah. of, I guess the because of the bio program the engineering really wasn't well, on the radar at that point in time was it so there's a couple things I knew that I wanted to go science and engineering so I needed to go technical um, I got into quite a few schools I didn't get into those Ivy League schools but I got into Boston University. RPI, uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, Rutgers University School of Engineering, you know, all good tier two engineering schools, but I also wanted to leave home. I needed to grow. I needed to get away from my hometown. So it needed to be far enough away, but close enough that I could get home. So there goes Stevens Institute and, uh, and uh, Rutgers University because I lived in New Jersey. But going to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, was about a three-hour drive. So it was far enough away. And it was a really, really, really good for science, engineering, management, and they have a great hockey team too, or they did back in the 80s. And so, uh, and I got a good financial aid package. So I said, let's just give it a go. Yeah. Would you, would you say that, would you say that distance and financial aid package were the most important characteristics for you when picking a school in addition to the, the academics of the university? I think I was going for academics excellence first. I did apply to Cornell, Lehigh, Bucknell, Villanova, some of the top tier, and I didn't get into the tier one. I wanted to go to a place with academic excellence. And when I looked at the portfolio of the schools that I did get into, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute just had a sound of prestige, plus um, try, at the time trying to get more women into the engineering program. And even today, there's not a lot of us that pursue that uh, career. So I think they were actively recruiting me as well. They made it financially uh, beneficial to go. And so it just combined everything, the distance, uh, the interest, the, the prestige of the school, and uh, the financial aid. Cool. So what kind of student yeah. were you in, in college? I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that you were, <laughs> you were the, I guess, the academic decathlon equivalent of biology in high school. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that you're, you were a phenomenal student in high school. Now, did that carry for you into college? Well, I didn't change. I yeah. knew how to study hard, but when you raise the bar, which I did, I went to a school where the bar was raised, I was no longer in the top five or 10%. <laughs> it's just what it was. So I took the challenge of going to a challenging school and it not being easy and never failed a course. I got D once in my senior year, but let's just chalk that up to senioritis. But, yeah. you know, getting a good C or a B was, I had to work for those. They were really, really, really smart people. Now, when I loved the area, uh, you know, like phys physiology, some of the biology work, some of the basic sciences, I got my A's in. But I'll tell you, sometimes that first semester physics, even though I took physics in high school, yeah, you get your C and gosh darn it, I worked really, really, really hard for it. At the end of the day, I'll tell you, nobody really cares about that A or that C or I won't even tell you again that I got a D in my senior year in a particular course is because what you do with that information and that knowledge. And I just had a solid foundation in solving problems and engineering. And again, the times they were in demand for a lot of engineers, colleges or companies would come to our college and heavily recruit. And I got a lot of job offers, regardless of the B, the C or the A. Makes sense. And, and I think that that's still the case. Uh, 
for uh, GPA is not the most important thing. Definitely, especially after you've gotten your first job. I know most of my colleagues. They, I mean, we don't include resume. Uh, we don't include GPAs on resumes at, at a certain point. So yeah, I think that it, it is. It is different it, it, when you go to college and go to engineering school. The bar is definitely raised. A lot of people mm. are shocked by that. A lot of people struggle with that. But I think it's a very consistent message that I'm hearing in these interviews that it it, it is harder but it's not the end of the world just because you're no longer making A's all the time. I, I think there's three three students that graduated in my engineering class that managed to maintain an A average all the way through engineering school, and I don't know how they did it. They're, they, I, I, it wasn't me. I was definitely not that person. Um, so I mean, you mentioned- it's, it's what you do with it. Again, yeah. that is one benchmark is it's all about getting the A, and I applaud those people that have gotten that, but it's what did you do with that? How did you get that A or that B or that C? And I'll tell you, engineering helps you to be a problem solver. It also helps you to work in teams because the collective knowledge of multiple people are what's going to help you get that B or maybe get that A. It's no longer an individual sport, engineering. You have to collaborate with other people. So while, while you were in school, were, were, were there any clubs or organizations that you were involved in or any internships that you got to do while you were in school before you started your career? Yeah, um, I'll t I tell you, I was very heads down into my studies. In retrospect, I probably should have done a few more clubs. Uh, back in high school, I was a musician. I played the clarinet, so I know for at least one year I played in the RPI band. And I will tell you, um, playing in the band when you have a Division One hockey team uh, is a big thrill because <laughs> you get to go to all the home games, get great seats, and you know cheer on some amazing teams. So RPI is known for engineers, but Division One hockey as well. Um, I probably took some dance classes. Uh, I hung out a lot at some fraternities, so there was a big social scene. But I will tell you, in retrospect, I did not, other than hanging out with friends, bowling, maybe going to the, the Catskills or the Adirondacks, you know, going to the mountains or traveling around a little bit, I didn't do as much with activities. And I would say to others, if you can squeeze it in, take advantage of the full college scene <laughs> because um, those activities could lead to other things. I was in some... Um, professional um, high performing groups. I did get into a group called the Professional Leadership Program in my senior year. It was designated for not only people that were engineers, but also had a lot of leadership skills. So with that year long program, I did get leadership development as well as going on some workshops, going on some hikes and things like that. Um, but other than that, I wish I had done more, but I did just fine. Yeah, no, you did just fine because you, you, you you graduated and you said you had multiple job offers and let's yeah. let's talk about that that experience so your first job out of school you you get your first job with Raytheon in their manufacturing department and their development program that they have and you do yeah. it's a rotational program so yeah. you go through four different 6 month rotations and then you you find your way as a quality control inspection engineer so how was how was your decision making choosing Raytheon how how did that go down so I actually got two job offers from Raytheon. It just so happened that while I was interviewing for what was going to be a product engineering role, and it also paid a little bit more, but I also got identified in the interview process as somebody that had leadership skills. So they actually, I, I can't recall exactly what happened, but I wound up then getting a second job offer for their manufacturing management development program, very similar to what they might have at a, a GE or something where you do the four, six month rotations. And I got paid at a lower rate, but by going through these rotations each, every six months, I got a raise. So at the end of the day, I either got the same amount of money or maybe even a little bit more after two years and think about all the breadth of experience I gained in different areas of management manufacturing, giving me an opportunity, one, to decide where did I want to eventually land, because you don't quite know what you want to do coming out of engineering school, and then the extra attention to develop leadership skills that I don't think I quite realized that I had, but I had the gift of communication, and in that, they saw leadership. So I benefited in the end by going with Raytheon. Uh, and also it took me again away from New Jersey. I wanted to again experience another part of the country. So compared to the other job offers, this was the best, but I did get uh, 
a job offer for Goodyear Tire and Rubber. There was a job offer at some, um, you know, Navy facility out in Connecticut. I can't remember, but uh, it it felt good <laughs> to get those all those job offers at a time when um, it was really good. I know it's not always been like that for engineering, but I was very fortunate and I ran with the best offer. Yeah. So you did this rotation and you did four different rotations. I think one of them was industrial engineering, another one in quality, mm -hmm. another one in production planning, yeah. and then I think another one in supervision. And then you mm -hmm. ended up choosing, I believe, to then quality. after you finished this program, become a quality control inspection engineer. So you chose quality. What was it about quality that was so interesting to you? So it's a great question. And for me, what it was, as I learned the individual disciplines, industrial engineering is the equivalent of like process engineering today. Being a supervisor leader, that was fine too. Production planning was interesting. But when I came to quality, quality has to kind of look around the room and say, are you following the standard? Are you following the standard? And you need to know enough about each area of manufacturing or product development to be able to assess, are we in conformance to the standard, the requirements, the rules, the specifications? I needed to know a little bit about everything. So it made my job very interesting. So there was a lot of breadth that I needed to know about the business versus being very siloed and having a lot of depth in one particular area. So that breadth was more attractive to me than just going into one discipline. That's wow. why I wound up in quality. It may have also been an indicator of your leadership potential there as well, because you were making your decisions based on wanting to understand the bigger picture. You know, you're right, probably, <laughs> to have that good decision logic, assess data, again, that engineering mind looking at the situation, what's in spec, out of spec, where, where can I bend the rules, uh, what will the customer want? It was all just this puzzle and problem solving in my head and to help the business or myself make the best decision. So you're right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so, so quality engineering then kind of, I guess, for at least the start of your career, kind of became your niche, right? So you, you were with Raytheon for seven years. You, you grew in into another quality role with them. And then eventually you left Raytheon to then become a quality assurance manager for another company called KDI Triangle Corp. So what was that transition like for you? What, at Raytheon, they rotated you through, they identified you as somebody with leadership potential. You were growing up through their program and you even got promoted within the organization a couple of times. What was, the, what was the moment when you realized you were ready to, to branch out make that first career transition of employers? So um, life happens. I was married at the time and had my first child and we were away in New England and the family was in New Jersey. My husband also was in the um, construction industry and in the early 90s in New England, that industry tanked, <laughs> didn't do very well. And we had family back home. My husband's father had a business and we just looked at each other and said, now's the time to move back home. And that's, and that's fine. And that was the right decision. So I actually went to the first company that hired me and it's not on my resume. Oh. It's a company called it's a company called Seton Leather, where I came in as a quality engineer. I had to work in a tannery where they take the hides off the cows and process them such that they ultimately become leather products for the automotive industry. I was in that job for five months, and this is one of the only times I made a bad career decision. I took a position that based on past history, I thought I could do it because it was similar. It was a quality engineer but I completely didn't know the industry and I was not making good decisions. So it was mutual that after five months I left and then I had two months to figure out what I wanted to do and apply, apply, apply for which then I landed at KDI Triangle um, Electronics Corporation. And there I arrived at a quality assurance manager role because I had led people and I knew about quality system standards. And so they needed somebody to fill that role. So it was my first leader, real, real leadership role of people and applying my quality and making sure we meet customer requirements. It was the natural progression for me. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting. Thank you for sharing that, that story about <laughs> that, that maybe that intermediate stop along the way. I'm, I'm sure that we could do an entire podcast episode about what you learned from that experience on its own. Mm -hmm. um, but so again, quality assurance manager, you you fit in 
and and you're there for four years. You got them through their ISO certification, which yeah. is a consistent thing on your resume as something that you did in all of your stops, probably yeah. as a quality engineer. After that, you were there for three years, and then you, you, you stayed in New Jersey, though, for your next career transition. So why did you end up leaving them? I feel like this is that old program that I don't even remember called This Is Your Life. <laughs> so tell me about it this. is. <laughs> this is your, you, uh, 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 our wonderful life. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's really interesting. So this was the first time that I was called and recruited for a role, yeah. which was really, really cool. Um, yeah. Again, I'm pretty stable, stayed at a company, but there was this very interesting uh, prospect. So back in the day, there was a company called Lucent Technologies, which used to be AT&T, and then there was a European company called Philips Electronics, very renowned in the telecom industry. They were forming a joint venture between the two to create Philips Consumer Communications. And I went into a joint venture because this was going to be the next big thing, high tech, et cetera. And it allowed me to go to a product development center and also interface with the Mexico manufacturing facility. And I will tell you, this is where I learned about process mapping. I learned about the tried and true method of Visio, Microsoft Visio. They still use it today, but that's where I really, really fell in uh, love with process which is starting to get me a little bit into that continuous improvement mindset. How can we make this process better, faster, cheaper, visual? How can I communicate with people? How can we make it better? Anyway, 18 months, amazing experience. And then they said, we're going to shut down the joint venture. It's not working. <laughs> so you got 60 days, everybody, to find a new job. So I was employed uh, and had 60 days to find a new job as that joint venture subsided. But I'll talk, talk to you. It was a great learning experience being able to go to a manufacturing facility and see what the engineers develop in New Jersey, go to Guadalajara, Mexico, and see what they're doing and, and just make sure we have the right process, make sure the quality is good. And then I had an opportunity to look for a new job. And then I found Tellium. But I won't go on to Tellium until you tell me I can go. <laughs> yeah, well, go for it. No, no, you you can manage the transition. So yeah, you, you director now, uh, director level now. Well, you're not just. I didn't a manager. start there. Oh really? Okay. I well, started out as a manager. Nice. This is one of the biggest career challenges, turning points, is Telium. So Telium was an optical networking company, part of that dot com area in the late '90s, early 2000s. Again, I'm dating myself, but hey, I, this is my conversation. So anyway, it is. It's your so, story. <laughs> so I get recruited into this. I obviously I hit the job job market and I got this opportunity. I entered as a quality assurance manager to acquire a department and build a department that will eventually be responsible for not only getting ISO 9001 certified, uh, but also build an organization such that we can start getting this new innovative product out to market. So fast forward, I learned a lot. I hired a lot of people. I was employee number 60 and was there until about employee, let's call it five or 600. We wow. went IPO. I had shares in the company. Everybody was going to be a millionaire out of this. It was a very exciting time to see the growth. Now, here's the problem. I was a quality assurance manager. And at the time, I was sweating bullets. I'm hiring people. We're shipping product. I go to the president of the company and I thought, first time ever advocated myself. I said, I need to be a director because I'm building an organization. I'm defining the future. X, Y, and Z, here's why I should be a director. And I remember the president of the company saying to me, he said, you know, I'm really proud of you. He said, so often when you're in a leadership role, you will advocate for others. And very few people know how to advocate for themselves. It's very difficult. Now I'll tell you, I was shaking. I was nervous. I used index cards. If people still use those, I wrote all the justification on an index card. My hand would have been just fine. And I used that as a crutch to express my value. And he says, because you advocated for yourself, I will give you the director position and the increase in pay. Whew. Talk about a learning experience. That was a big thing that engineers just don't know how to do. They figure if I just do my work and I get the results and I put the PowerPoints up and prove to them that what direction we need to go to, I'm going to move up in my career. And yes, that's true to a point. But learning these skills like advocating for yourself for a promotion, whew, those are real life skills. Now, the story goes south. 
<laughs> I'm 35 years old in a leadership role. We wind up actually failing our ISO audit. I'm also called to the mat about how I'm communicating. You know, email is starting to boom. I'm communicating a certain way. People are slapping me on the wrist. You shouldn't do things that way. And I have no manager to coach me. Nobody correcting what I'm doing or what I should do differently. And it causes stress. I was miserable. I was eventually downsized out of the company when I was about seven months pregnant with my third child. Now, what was it? You can try to reflect on what were all the reasons. What I will say from that experience was, whew, thank God. <laughs> I was no longer in that company. Um, the company eventually folded. They never actually replaced me. Um, I didn't become a millionaire, but I did make a little bit of money off the shares to be able to stay home with my third child for a while. But I realized the importance of coaching and mentorship. So as you move up there in your career, make sure you have that support system, just like your podcast is a support system for engineers. I didn't have that. And so I realized it's real stress in the area of quality engineering, quality leadership. And I swore up and down again, I would never have that situation. I would always ask for feedback, look to improve myself. And while I exited that business, the transition to my next job was so much better because I was so much more wiser. So it was the best experience ever and one of the worst experiences. Yeah, I feel like that the worst experiences are the ones we learn the most from and that, that help us get into the right place. And for you, it was kind of your first, it allowed you to have your first foray into what I, at least looking at your resume, would observe to be one of your, I guess your specialty or your industry that has become kind of your niche is the the flavors and fragrances industry. So you, you got hired on as a re regional quality assurance manager, or at least you were eventually promoted into a role as a regional right. quality assurance manager for international flavors and fragrances. Yeah. So how'd you find your way into the fragrances industry with this company? So this was an interesting turning point. And I think this plays into letting your engineering audience know that your career can go in many different directions. So after having a big job. I was the director of quality assurance for an optical networking company. And then I had some time off six months to be home with my third child and my second and my first. And I had to then eventually go back to work. My husband was going through a career change and we agreed that after six months, I needed to go back to work. But I said, I don't want to have that high pressure role. I just want to go back as an individual contributor. And when this job came up as quality engineer, about two levels down from where I was, but the compensation was good. It was near my home and it was a different industry. And I was kind of interested in like, well, what do they see in me? I've always been in electronics manufacturing or product development, but they said specifically how I presented myself, my background in quality was what they needed. And they said they wanted somebody outside the industry with a different set of eyes because that industry was always hiring the same kind of people. And they had the mindset to hire from outside. And so that's where engineers sometimes get stuck. They think I can only do this. But if you've honed your skills and realize that they are transferable, and that you can learn pretty quick about that specific business and customize what you know. You can transcend and move into other industries. So that was the beauty of moving in at two levels down, doing a job I know it could do. But if you do that, it allows you to go sideways in your career and then quickly up again. So then I got promoted to quality supervisors, overseeing a department of inspectors, and then eventually uh, got into being a quality assurance manager, not only over the fragrance division, but also the flavors division, because I was able to make so many process improvements, reducing defects. They said, we got to leverage that over to our flavors business. So I learned both the fragrance and flavors business, again, a chemical-based industry, but again, transferable skills that I learned over in the electronics industry. So that was a glorious nine years. And I had advocates and they really allowed me to grow and I was able to return a lot of value. It's awesome. And it, it, it's funny how you said, oh, I'll, I'll take a step down. I don't want to be a, a man anymore. I want to be an individual contributor. Nine years later, then you've, uh, you've done a lot of managing <laughs> since you've been there. So since you were there. Uh, it, it looks like also at this point in your career, lean became a big part of what you were doing. What was, what was that was, 
I don't even know the timeline of whenever Lean took off, but I, I, obviously yeah. it became a big part of your career at that point in time. Well, let's just say at that point in time, we were just dipping our toe into it. And so I was at the early stages where they would bring in a consultant and start teaching us basic lean principles of waste and 5S. And we maybe dabbled in it a little bit at that time in the late, you know, 20. 2010 time period, it wasn't that big a thing. And I learned a little bit about it. I was more on the Six Sigma uh, defect reduction time. So I learned a lot about statistics and how to reduce defects, reduce variability, how to run a full project. I learned all of that. that. Those are the skills that I really honed while I was at IFF Flavors and Fragrance. Lean became my nemesis and my success at the next company but I'll wait for you to tell me I can transition. (laughs) Well, actually, you know, before we do that, so would you, when you got there, you you ended up growing into a lot of new spaces. Were there, were there, Mm -hmm. were were there periods of time where you were asked to either move into something new that maybe wasn't really part of your job description uh, whenever you started or, or where you were, you were kind of the guinea pig for the company, and to, you mentioned that where they were experimenting with lean. We we were there roles like that, opportunities like that, where you presented, "Hey, can you try to do this thing. I know it's not your thing, but would you would you be the person that steps into this for us?" And if how how did you approach that? Well, I had the good fortune in this company to have advocates or have people approach me and pull me in certain directions. Sometimes as engineers, we beat our heads against the wall and push into opportunities when maybe we don't have advocates or we're not in the right environment for our value to be seen. So what was different for me was I knew the fragrance industry. I'd been on that side of the business for five, six years. I did not know the flavors industry because where fragrance is pretty much you just mix things together and make sure the quality of the raw ingredients are there to have a repeatable process. In the flavors industry, there's a lot of manufacturing processes that involve heating and pressure and distillation and extraction. And so there was science that I didn't understand. But at the time, it didn't really bother me. I spent enough time with the process engineers or watching the processes on the floor to understand them enough, just like a quality person has to know a little bit about everything, understand the process enough to then start pulling out my quality um, toolbox and be able to say, oh, that's inefficient or you've got a lot of deep effects in that. Yes, I would probably have to pull in an expert in that area, the industrial engineer, the process engineer, but quality allowed me to be a chameleon and go into most any manufacturing environment and quickly learn the process from A to Z and their critical points, their critical control points. What were their problem areas? So I wasn't bothered. I was pulled into it and I learned what I needed to learn. What became challenging for me, though, was I also had a lot of skills in Six Sigma. I was using Six Sigma problem-solving skills. Corporate quality pulled me because they wanted to take this global. And so what they did is they pulled me into their team to start going global and teaching other people the techniques. We'll talk about needing to learn new tricks. One, I, I did statistics, but I'd never taught it before. (laughs) <laughs> oh my, having to learn how to do a design of experiments or I, you know, what I forgot the T, T tests, F tests, or what have you. And by the way, teach it to people where English is not their primary language. Oh my, <laughs> that was a challenge. But when I figured out how I could teach it to myself and then teach it to others, I was really pushed out of my comfort zone. But the reward of it all was people that were not normally English speaking people, me trying to teach high level statistics. They said, thank you. You taught it in such a way that was used simple English. You communicated in a way that I could process it because they were translating in their head, understand the concepts and be able to respond and ask questions. Whereas my colleague who was smarter than me was using slang and American English, which was a disservice to other engineers who were trying to process that. So I just, I was pulled into these situations because I was good. I was a good communicator and I just grew and grew and grew with that organization. So at that time, I wasn't bothered by pulling in th- into things that I didn't quite understand. I knew I could learn along the way. It's cool. And it's so grateful 
that I mean, I'm so grateful to hear that you had advocates that were helping do that pulling for you. Are these advocates people? I know I've stuck on this one for a while, but I have lots of questions. Uh, are these advocates people that kind of identified themselves to to you, or did you seek them out? How did you find these these people that could help you grow in your career? This is such a great question. You're so you're so smart. These are really good. So if you don't have an advocate, gosh darn it, find them. Just just start networking within your company. Find people that you get along with that get you. What they're doing is is really cool. And maybe you do some things for them to help them out. Maybe they're in sales. Maybe they're in procurement, supply chain, or something like that. Become an advocate for them or, or, or do pro bono work for them. Become a partner because they will be the people that may become your advocates or say, what you did over here was really interesting. Can you do it on this team? And you create, I'm sorry, create pull. What happened at IFF was my advocates went away. They got promoted <laughs> above and was replaced with great people, but they weren't my advocates. They needed me to do my job, which often will keep an engineer down in a role because they don't want to lose you or they're not good at career development say well you could go over here you could go over there I didn't have advocates pulling me along so I got to a place I was being pulled into a lot of different tasks global projects but I wasn't getting the promotions or the recognition so I'm beating my head against the wall I start looking here I start looking there and the next thing I know the next company calls me and I go okay, so, so I had to find new advocacy when I lost it yeah, no, that makes sense. So the next new company is, I can't pronounce it. So can you help me? Givadon. It's Swiss. It's Givadon. Givadon. <laughs> Givadon flavors. So nine years, nine really good years at IFF. And then you go work at Givadon. Do they do stuff for like Giordano? Like, like it sounds like they do stuff for Giordano chocolate. No, I'm, not, I'm probably not even they pronouncing could. that correctly. They could. They, they could. Yeah. I mean, they're flavors and fragrance company. And so their flavors are all over the place. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Unilever. I mean, haagen ice wow. cream everywhere. I mean, so but the same with IFF at the time. Givadon is the number one company globally. And IFF was number three at the time. Wow. So they're all in the same camp. They're all going into the big name companies, offering samples of their things to solve particular uh, problems. So, yeah. So Givadon was just a bigger player in the field. That's cool. So, man, your job must have smelled so good. I, I'm just thinking about that in the back of my head right now. It must have smelled so, or, or maybe it was horrible because there were just so many different smells mixing with one another. <laughs> that, that is, that's, that's a sidebar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are good days and bad days. When you're on the fragrance side, you can smell wonderful, but the individual ingredients that go into making a fragrance don't always smell good. And if you were in a spice plant and then had to jump on a plane, Oh, oh my, no. you oh. wish you've had a shower or change of clothes. <laughs> I imagine. Okay, so Jadon, you're there six years and you, I'd say that your titles skyrocket. Operational Excellence Manager, Head of Operational Excellence for America, Head of Quality North America. I feel like your career kind of skyrocketed there. Would you agree that you got to yeah. kind of grow a lot there? <clears throat> Yeah, so I was very intentional and knew what I wanted. When I was with IFF, I worked, I had the opportunity to work regionally. Um, but I wasn't really, and I was responsible for quality in two plants, but not all the plants. I just knew I wanted to have a higher impact. I wanted to be responsible for a larger um, number of plants. I just knew I had more to give. And moving to Givadon first as a quality, it was basically, again, a step down in order to get into a bigger company as a quality and operational excellence manager in New Jersey. But ha what happened is I raised my hand. Oh, Cincinnati's having a hard time. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. And I was soon recognized that I was able, I had some really, really great problem solving skills. And so regionally, they started leveraging me. They started sending me to Kentucky, to Ohio, to Florida, even though I was a New Jersey resource. Well, uh, several things happened. There was some organizational chaos. I accepted a job at another company. I was going to leave Givadon because I was not being considered to be the head of operational excellence for North America for then five plants. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of um, 
process improvement. And I almost left the company. And in came the new vice president of operations who talked to me about why was I leaving? I said, because I'm sitting here in New Jersey doing this, that, and the other thing. And I saw on the internet that they were looking externally for the replacement. I said, you didn't even come and approach me. So I had my day in court. I told them exactly why I was leaving and I wasn't being recognized. The next thing I know, I get the job offer, but you have to move to Cincinnati, Ohio. So Hurricane Sandy had just hit New Jersey. Industry was devastated. (laughs) So was my husband's business. We just needed a reset. The economy was terrible in New Jersey. My two boys were in college. I had a daughter going into middle school. We said, you know what? This is the perfect reset for our family. Let's make the move. So we left most of our family in New Jersey. And I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio to become the head of operational excellence, where we had to turn this into a money-making machine uh, because we needed to become a cash cow to return money to the bottom line so they could start opening up plants in other parts of the world. Oh my, having to build an organization of experts in all the plants, set up training for quality and then, or in in Six Sigma, and then guess what? Guess what? That lean card came out. They said, we're not going to be on a Six Sigma journey. You better throw that out, which was my area of expertise. We're on a lean journey. We are going to make process improvements in the area of lean. We're hiring an external consultant and you're going to have to lead the charge in North America. (gasps) I didn't know how to lead an organization in lean. Talk about, oh my, I could have crumbled. And there's a whole story behind it, but I had to get myself quickly educated to a certain level to understand lean and get my green and my black belt certification in order to be credible and lead others to say, this is what we need to do to get rid of operational inefficiencies, serve our people and be able to get $5 $5 million in cost savings annually. I did it with the help of many. And so awesome. it was huge change. I had I, That's when I was scared. How can I lead in an area that I didn't have the technical expertise? I had to figure it out. So I'll pause there before I get to the head of quality. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. So you, you, you that, that's a really cool uh moment there where I, I, I guess you realized you could pretty much do anything uh, but but then you decided to go back to quality which is m- maybe more your, your the thing that you're you specialize in so why'd you why'd you leave that role to go back to quality so here's the thing quality and operational excellence are very tightly clo- um, they're very close to each other there's aspects of quality that make sure you follow certain standards then there's an element of problem solving where you know you have a customer complaint what is the root cause uh, why did we have that defect um, and so I was working very closely with the head of quality while I was the head of operational excellence. We partnered, we did a lot of projects together and I was learning from him and he was learning from me where there was really good synergy. Advocacy, advocacy was happening while I was working closely with the head of quality. And when he got a job offer and was leaving the company, I was the designated person and recommended me to take his spot. And was I ready? I don't think so. There was a lot of things I did not know specific to quality at the number one global flavors company in North America. There's a lot I didn't know. But I was at a place where when I was asked to take that job, do you want it? I said, yes. And I realized I had a lot to learn. But that's a key thing is that when you're at a place where maybe you're anywhere between that 60 and 80 percent where you think you're ready, have faith in yourself that you're going to take those bag of tricks from those other roles and bring them forward and figure it out. And I did, and I was successful and I had some lumps and bumps, but there was an advocate that came into my life that recommended me and I got the job that I'd always wanted. And it was not just five plants. We acquired companies and eventually I was responsible for eight plants in North America for the quality quality, better, faster, cheaper, and safer, which was the additional dimension that I didn't know that well. Food safety is huge. You don't want to be that company that winds up in the news. So 
challenging job. It was the job I always wanted. And I thrived in it. I grew in it. And then I decided to change. Yeah. So you, you, you've you climbed the mountain, you, the proverbial mountain of yeah. your career. You've, you've reached the point where you've accomplished your career goal. Was that, did you feel like a weight came off your shoulders in that moment that felt, give you the permission to pursue what maybe you were most passionate about at that point? I had, a, I felt like I had arrived. I yeah. had the prestige and the responsibility and authority to do great things. And it, it was just amazing hiring people, working with plant managers to help them with their quality issues, um, you know, and quality initiatives, what have you. It was really interesting work and grew a lot of people that worked for me. I helped a lot of people grow their career, talented, talented engineers, food scientists, et cetera. That was probably the biggest thrill that I had in that role was knowing that I was no longer the technical expert, but hiring people around me or pulling people from the plants, these amazing engineers, scientists, et cetera, um, to do the work. And what I found was they had shortcomings. They maybe weren't efficient. Maybe they didn't know how to communicate their message. I came into my leadership finest to be able to unleash their potential and amplify the impact of our region, where we started out as number four out of four regions. And eventually through me changing my leadership style and helping to elevate the technical capability of my team, did we then move to the number two position in 18 to 24 months? That was a real thrill that I realized this is my purpose now. This is what I need to do is elevate people to have a greater impact. And elevating people to have a greater impact turned out to not be with the company that you were with anymore. And you, in you reaching it and you arriving turned out to be you branching off to do your own thing. Uh, so this is right. This is 2019. You branched off. You created your own LLC called Illumination Partners, and then you started doing contract work. Why did you decide to start your own thing and and no longer have this one company being your employer anymore? Why Why did you break off and, and start your LLC? So it was a mutual decision for us to part ways. It was a really interesting time because we had also run into quite a few quality issues for which we were managing them. But for me personally, I was starting to get very stressed with the amount of work. And even when I did have the right support structure, it was very, very, very stressful. It was no more, it wasn't fun anymore. And my boss came to me and we had a conversation and we made a decision for me to mutually separate from the company. And these, these types of things happen to the best of us. And it was absolutely the best thing that ever happened. And I was, le I left the company with dignity. I was able to tell my story that I wanted to do something different. And I wasn't sure exactly what that was. And I got to set my own timeline of when I left. And it was a rather nice severance package. So they did it with, we, we did it with the utmost respect, giving me the time and respect to be able to do what I wanted to do next. Now, did I know what I wanted to do next? Not quite, but I knew I didn't want to work for a large corporation anymore because of all the issues. It just, I felt very stifled. I couldn't be creative. I couldn't do things in my own way. My leadership style was appreciated by some, but not all. So I eventually, after months of reflection, said, I think I can do this on my own, but I want to do it for small and medium-sized companies, not large companies, and be able to try to find clients that I can serve. Now, it has been an uphill battle. It could be a whole nother podcast on how to figure out who do I serve, what problems do I solve, getting my talking points, and ultimately the podcast, the book, and all of that other stuff. It's hard in the beginning, but what is easy is believing in yourself that I have these skills that I can help other companies with, but do it for the companies I love, not be a permanent employee, help them during a particular time or a crisis and move on or be a trusted partner. I wanted to do that work versus being tied to a company and losing my identity. I regained my identity by going out on my own. So, yeah. And, and you started doing all these different contract roles and, you, you describe them as fractional chief quality officer. So what right. is what is a fractional? I I look at it as a, as a, you're an executive leader almost at this point. You know what what is a fractional 
leader do for a company? So there are small and medium-sized companies that know they might need a quality person, but they'll rely on their production manager to do everything from producing and assuring quality. But they might hit a juncture where they probably need to hire a quality leader, but they can't afford somebody full-time. The best investment for these small and medium-sized companies is to hire somebody that has all the experience in the world. They could drop right in, know exactly what is needed to be done, and act and be part of that business, but not five days a week. They can maybe be in one or two days a week and provide the same value as if they hired a full-time person, but they leverage our years and years and years of experience. We're not just consultants. Yes, we'll know exactly how to fix their quality department or establish a quality department, but I could do it in a fraction of the time. And so what they do is they get high value for a low investment. And I partner with the company until you get to a place where maybe you don't need me anymore. Maybe they get a couple new contracts for it. And then I can even help them hire a permanent person to replace me. It's about leveraging expertise inserted in your business at the rate that you need it. And there is a growing, growing market of very experienced people like myself, fractional operations officers, finance officers, marketing officers. Again, you might think we're just consultants, but consultants have a dirty, uh, a bad name for themselves. I do an inspection and here's my bill. Have at it and do these things. No, I become part of the business. I become yeah. that leader, that interim leader that they need. So that's what a fractional leader does. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're more so integrated in the team than the typical consultant. Hey, I work in engineering consulting. So I hear, I hear, I, I, I hear the, I hear, I hear what you're saying there about consultants. Mm -hmm. It's it's us and you, but you know, we have seconded, we, have, we second people and, and embed people mm -hmm. into people's teams. So it's kind of like a seconded or like a seconded chief quality officer. Uh, I, I guess that's how I wrap my head around it. Am I, am I? Yeah, I've done this time and time again. I've done this multiple times for different clients for anywhere from one month to three months to I keep coming coming back every six months for two or three month assignments. Yeah. And what is what have you learned about yourself from taking in these these roles and these fractional roles? Have you have you enjoyed? Because I'll be honest, for me, having to deal with that many different sets of stakeholders sounds stressful. Uh, so how, 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 what have you learned about yourself and, in, in working in these roles? Well, you learn time management and time blocking yeah. because some clients can be a little crazy and some can be very hands off and learning not to be bouncing between one client and another within a day is highly disruptive. So it is better to time block a little bit, like Monday and Tuesdays, I'm going to work on this client. And while I may monitor email and respond to a few phone calls on the other days, I'm going to focus on this client Wednesday and Thursday, knowing I'll get back to that other one. Because I learned about myself when I kept jumping around between one, even within a day, within an hour, I wasn't as effective. But I know, and I just did it this summer, I can handle three full-time clients at the same time, but you will burn out. So you do have to also learn what is your capacity so that you don't burn out and don't fall out of love with the clients that you serve. I've learned a lot that way. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you do all this under your entity, Illumination Partners, but I think you also do other things under that entity. I mean, you've written, you've written your book, you have your podcast. What is Illumination Partners? I've, I've, I've said it briefly, but, but maybe you give you an opportunity to share the whole story. So Illumination Partners is representative of what I was feeling when I was trying to figure out what am I going to do next, and I wanted to form a company. And one thing that kept showing up in my life were beautiful, bright lights. We would go to a hardware store, and I'd be looking up at the lights. And I was very inspired by lights. And my daughter keeps saying I must have been a moth in a previous life because I'm attracted to lights. But there's also then the element of ideation and creativity and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So I formed a company called Illumination Partners, and while much of the time the face of the business is me, however, through the podcast and lots and lots and lots of networking, it is truly Illumination 
partners. Because if I can't answer a question for a client, I got an army of people behind me in my database, in my network that I've either asked questions of or I've actually brought them in on assignments. And if I ever get to the place of maximizing my capacity, I'm getting ready to be able to bring other partners in such that we can grow the company and not be limited by just myself. So that's Illumination Partners, me and a lot of smart people that I can pull in when I need to and I have. And then you go by the drop in CEO. And I, I, I said mm-hmm. it earlier, and you've hinted at it in what you said dropping in. But yeah, why why the drop in CEO? So this is a very interesting question, and it's a really cool story. And I don't necessarily drop in as the CEO of the company, but I often drop in and partner with the CEO because it's a lonely place being a CEO or a vice president of a company or a founder. And sometimes they need a partner to merge with them to understand what are the opportunities or challenges and solve a specific business issue. So I go in with a set of eyes as a CEO on what need, what treatment is needed. Now, how did we ever find the drop in CEO? Well, it's an interesting thing because early in my journey, six months into building my business, I found podcasting and I found a few podcasts to guest on. And during the process, they said, tell me what you do. What, how do you, what's your approach to solving problems? And I start describing it on this podcast. And I say, well, I'm kind of like the drop-in CEO. I assess the landscape. I solve the business issue. And I also elevate people's capability. And then you pull me out. And at the end of the interview, they said, that's brilliant. Where did you get drop-in CEO from? And I said, oh, I said, I don't know. But then I had a flash of a memory. When I was at Tellium, that company that I eventually got let go from, but they went through rapid growth. Because we went IPO, there was a lot of money hinged on this company. And we were at a place where we were having challenges. They dropped in a CEO to work with myself and the head of operations to solve business issues. And he rolled up his sleeves and worked directly with us to solve the issue and also build up our confidence because we were new to our roles. And then when the company got big enough and we were getting ready to go IPO, they pulled him out and put in new leadership because he had done his job. And I remember that persona of how he made me feel and how he operated Mike. Forgot his last name, but Mike. I've never been able to find him or connect with him, but his name was Mike. My God, I think Mike. Anyway, and so what happens is the person who interviewed me said, that's brilliant. You should stick with that. And I couldn't own that because I said, I'm not a CEO and I've never been a CEO before, but I act like it. And so about six months in, I got the podcasting bug and I said, you know what? I'm going to call the podcast, the drop-in CEO. And then I later trademarked it and I realized One, I'm a talented engineer and problem solver, but I can't keep going on as just a fractional leader or a business consultant. I need to differentiate myself in order to get out ahead of the pack. They don't teach that to engineers on how to market yourself and build a unique brand. There's no other Deb Covey L in the world. You know, there's not a lot of female engineers that have been in the industries that I've had that have ascended to leadership, who've now gone out on my own and have learned how to market themselves. I need it to be unique. So hence, I am the drop-in CEO. I am trademark. That is my brand. And it is the persona of a person that is seeking to simply partner with C-suite leaders of today and tomorrow have them navigate, help them to navigate their challenges with confidence, whether you're a CEO or an engineer or technical leader moving up in your career and you get stuck and you don't have a support system. I'm that person that can help you with your leadership skills because I care about both demographics. So that's what the drop-in CEO brand is about. And it's very unique and I'm very proud of it. And a lot of people think it's real cool. So I'm keeping it. <laughs> I think it's really cool too. And it, I think it's cool that you expanded the brand to also write your book, The CEO's Compass, your guide to get yeah. back on track. So does it speak to both of those demographics or does it focus on one of the two? <laughs> so this is a crazy conversation. So when I was working with my book coach or my somebody that helped me to publish the book, she said, the rule of thumb when you write a book is to be to write it to a single audience. So whoever picks up the book knows that I'm speaking to them. Initially, the book was written for both of them. But at the end of the day, I settled on it's meant for the CEO of the company because I want to give them a compass that whenever they're wildly successful but somehow go off track, I'm not going to give you a cookie cutter way on how to get back on track because I don't know your industry. I don't know you. 
but I give you a compass to look at a couple different ways of your business situation and directions that you can go in to shore up and be able to get you to peace of mind. So the CEO's compass is for the C-suite leader, the CEO who's lost their way. Secrets of the C-suite has basically been already drafted in 2023. Nice. And all the content that I created on my solo episodes on my podcast in 2023 were all topics for the sweet, sweet leader of tomorrow or somebody that wanted to have impact or influence and have a seat at the table to be able to express. Hence, the secrets of the C-suite. So I have all the transcripts from every podcast, and I simply need to edit them together in a way that speaks to that person that doesn't have a support system because I want to be there for them. That is cool. Thanks for sharing more about your your two books. I, I definitely, I'm ashamed to say that I haven't read either of them yet, but I, it, they're definitely on my list. Of, well, obviously I can't read the second one because it's not published yet. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I haven't read your unpublished book. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, the CEO's compass, you're going to get them back on track. I'm not a CEO, but I think that you said that it was it originally matter. written for both audiences. So it's definitely going to be something that I have to, to pick right. up and read myself. How do you elevate your game unless you start learning how to act at the next level and be exactly and start thinking of yourself at the next level? That's how you move up. Yeah, exactly. It, it's I, hey, when people ask me what I want to be doing one day, I, I say I want to be running the company. So I, I, I keep I keep that I, I act like it and uh, I communicate it and maybe I need to read like it as well. Deb, thank you so much for for sharing about your 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 book and, and your podcast. Now, looking back on on and on, on your career. So looking back on that career, I mean, is there anything that 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 we've missed or any big takeaways. I, I know advocacy is a big one that you've hinted at, but any big, it's, it's a hard question to ask, but is there any overarching advice that you'd give to a young and aspiring engineer that's considering engineering uh, that they should keep in mind or consider whenever they're pursuing a, a career? Or, I don't know. That, that, that's There's a horrible a way to ask the question, but yeah, biggest takeaway for you, you in your career. Well, just know, Daniel, that, you know, we spent a little time t together and I know what kind of impact you want to have on the people listening to this show. So let me leave a few thoughts with somebody out there. And mind you, one's career doesn't necessarily have to go up. It could increase in breadth. You may want to simply be a senior technical lead and mentor others. I'm not saying that you have to go up in your career but think about how you can increase your value and impact. And there's a couple of things that I want to leave with the audience is if you want that next job or that next level or the next position, you have to believe that you're already at that level because sometimes we hold ourselves back and don't know how to speak to the people that are already in that position. But when the day you start seeing yourself as just another human being and you can see and envision yourself in that next role, let's just say it is up some thing happens, confidence comes with, and other people start seeing you in that role. It's a form of self-advocacy, which leads me into self-advocacy. Don't wait to say that you're 100% ready for that role or you've got all the certifications. It's more about what value do you provide and what problems have you solved and being visible. Again, I talk about this. Make yourself visible. Share your work. You don't have to be showy. You may be humble, but be visible in how you're helping others. And if you see an opportunity, learn how to advocate yourself. Practice on somebody. It's not that hard. It's a new skill. Because if you want to realize your dreams, you want to run the company, you already have to start seeing yourself at the next level and advocate for yourself and show your value in order to get there. It's that easy, but it takes a long time to learn. And sometimes you need a support system, whether it's this podcast that you're listening to right now, or maybe somebody like me might be a place that you can just talk to for a few minutes and maybe I can impart some thoughts with you. So Daniel, thank you so much for having me on the show and sharing my insights with your audience. Hopefully it was interesting. <laughs> It was interesting to me, and, and thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed listening to that interview as much as I enjoyed listening to it and being a part of it. Uh, Deb, thank you so much again for your time. And if you thought it was a good interview, please make sure to either write into 
uh, Apple Podcasts, give me a five-star review there or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to share it, like, comment down below. It really helps me out. The engagement in the videos really helps me out, especially those of you that have been commenting in my why is the engineering dropout rate so high video. Thank you so much for engaging with that video. It's been very successful. I think we have 26,000 views, but your engagement with the podcast by sharing, by commenting, by giving your feedback is the best way to help the show grow. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you guys in the next episode. I'm not complaining. No, I'm not complaining. My thoughts get complicated. I cannot explain in lameness. Never losing focus because I ain't chasing payments. Still playing in the basin while I'm working on arrangements. They heard the kid in 50 countries. Thank God that's the Amazing, but I'd rather think Spotify they put me on the station.